And hello, everyone. I am Tiffany Farrell, president of Southern Maryland Audubon Society. Thank you for joining our Audubon chapter for this monthly program. Its title is United States Geological Survey North American Breeding Bird Survey. This survey is considered the primary source of trend information for North American bird life and is active in tracking Maryland birds. This evening, we will learn how the survey works and how birds ranges and populations have changed. We are extremely lucky to have as our speaker tonight, Dave Zolkowski, a wildlife biologist who manages the North American Breeding Bird Survey, that's BBS for short, at the USGS Eastern Ecological Science Center. That's what most of us know as the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. He has been actively involved in wildlife research for more than 30 years, both in the United States and abroad, and has worked on myriad topics spanning the fields of ecology, evolutionary biology, biogeography, toxicology, and population monitoring. And who would have guessed? He's an avid birder adventure, and, and adventure traveler in his spare time. Dave is also a self-described horticulture nut, but mentioned that he will try to keep tonight's topics to just the birds. So welcome, Dave. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for having me tonight. Um, Tiffany mentioned that I have a colleague here as well, a biologist for the Breeding Bird Survey Program, Mikey Lupmerding, who many of you may know from birding circles in Southern Maryland. And he'll be helping me out and answering some questions in the chat. But um, I'll encourage you just as uh, Tiffany had to hold off until the end if, if you have any questions you're looking for detailed answers on and we can take some time and talk about it then. Uh, <clears throat> well, geez, one thing I wanted to say is uh, during these times you have to tell people it's a real pleasure to be sharing time with you tonight. Thank you for making the time and I'm really enjoying this so far. And you know, it's a weird time we're living in. It's a weird place we're living in. I mean, everybody should give yourself a pat on the back right now for having gotten through the past year. And if you allow me, I'm gonna take you away from that back in time a little bit here, way back. Um, one thing I do wanna forewarn you though, let me see if I can get my screen to work here. There you go, is that uh, on this journey, we are going to have to see some graphs it's just part of working with breeding bird survey information. So uh, bear with me, we'll get through it together. I'll try to explain the graphs as best as possible. They're not very complicated. As I said, though, I wanna take you way back. Let's go back to 1966. So let's talk a little bit about what was going on back then so we can get into the mindset. 66 uh, Camaro had just come out. It was gonna be sold in 67. The, um, the St. Louis Arch was being commemorated had just been completed. The ill-fated uh, Twin Towers in um, New York were just being uh, started. Ground was just broken on those. In the movie world, The Sound of Music and Dr. Zhivago were dominating the circuit and the award circuit. And on TV, these things that we now know to be classics like uh, the Peanuts Great Pumpkin television show and the original Batman and uh, the original Star Trek series, they were first airing in 1966. Bob Dylan released the, the infamous Blonde on Blonde album and the Beach Boys had pet sounds and the Beatles had just released Revolver and then were going into the, um, into the studio to start working on Sgt. Peppers. Oh, and let's keep it local too. I, <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the formerly named Washington Redskins scored in the, in the highest scoring NFL game ever. And they won. And the Orioles, go O's, won the world championship that year. So you know this was a very long time ago, long, long ago. Things have changed quite a bit. But it wasn't all uh, milk and honey back then. There were other things that were going on. It was... Um, a really revolutionary time in a lot of ways. There were Vietnam protests going on. There were, 
uh, civil rights marches going on. We were in the midst of the Cold War. We were caught up in a space race. And we are at the very beginning of what you might call the better living through chemistry revolution. And a big part of that revolution was the remarkable results that people were seeing from these organic chloride pesticides like DDT and heptachlor and dieldrin. But as you all know now, these things persist in the environment and they have a tendency to continue poisoning birds for a long time after their application, even when they're applied in very small amounts. Originally, you know, this was just these rural, cam uh, rural campaigns to eliminate spruce budworms and agricultural pests, but it expanded pretty quickly to include urban mosquito spraying and Dutch elm disease and other residential areas, including college campuses, started using um, DDT and, of course, dead birds started showing up. So this prompted this one person in the Midwest to write a letter to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist Chan Robbins to ask if there was any way of knowing whether continental bird populations were starting to decline. Chan lamented that he didn't know for sure. So he wrote back and he said, you know, I really can't tell you. I'm just not certain. But that didn't sit well with Chan and anybody who knew Chan knows that he set to work right away to try to come up with some kind of a rigorous monitoring program that could be used to monitor bird populations across the United States. And he was ahead of his time. I mean, this was, this was a good 10 years before the word environment was really starting to show up in the popular lexicon. So he, he foresaw what was coming. Um, I'm sorry if I seem a little distracted here. I'm working between multiple screens trying to get things to move along. The first question Chan had when he was um, starting to work on this survey is he, he had to decide what aspect of birds will I monitor? And that's actually a pretty big question. We take it for granted. You know, there's just there's all these different aspects of birds and we, we sort of like it, they merge together and we don't really separate them. But if you're gonna create a project where you're gonna be creating data um, or collecting data, you really have to be very careful to define exactly what you're looking for. So there's a bunch of things um, you can monitor with birds. I'll just name a few here. One is their spatial distribution. We call it the geographic range sometimes, right? Um, we see it in field guide maps. Those things change in time. We can see their occurrence phenology changing in time. So basically, you know, their seasonal abundance and their arrival and departure times. That's a big issue now, of course, with climate change. We can look at their life history phenology and see when do they breed? Is it the same time um, every year? Is it changing in time? When are they molting? Um, some of these other energetically expensive activities birds do. And what's their breeding productivity like? Is it the same year after year or some years worse than other years? And heck, are they surviving the same way? Are they dying more frequently in some years or at younger ages? or population size. And Chan decided what he was going to try to measure is population size. So that's a simple thing to do, right? We're just going to measure the whole population of uh, American robins across the continent. Simple, right? Well, you know, the big challenge here, of course, is that it's extremely difficult to get a total population count. Very, very, very difficult. The only times you're really able to do that are in these super ideal situations, like um, if you have colonial nesting water birds and somehow you know they're all going to be in their col a colonial nesting spot at the same time, then you can do it that way. But even if you do it at that time, you're still going to miss a lot of birds that are moving around um, because there are some birds that are just not breeding at that time. So at any rate, there's a lot of complexity to this, um, and there's a lot of reasons for that complexity. But one of the really big things, the key things, is that birds are not easy to detect. We tend to take it for granted that they are easy to detect because almost every time we're out, we're he we do hear some birds at some times. But in fact, most birds in a population are not doing things that make them detectable. So you miss a lot of them. I'm gonna give you a great example here because this is a really cool idea called detectability and, and birders, have a love-hate relationship with it. Sometimes they believe it happens and sometimes they don't. But I'm gonna give you two examples here to really impress what detectability is all about. There's two birds here right now. 
And, um, you know, if you know what it is, you can go ahead and write it in the chat or, um, or just hold it in your mind and I'll tell you what it is in just a minute. But both of these birds are birds that if you look at your checklist from a, um, for your county or even from um, a state park or a federal reserve, you'll see these birds are listed as rare. The first bird on the left-hand side is, is considered rare because it has another bird that it's very similar, um, a very similar looking congener to it. Um, and so you really have to hear it by ear to um, discriminate it. And the other one on the right is just hard to find sometimes because it's a sculptor. Um, the one on the left is an alder flycatcher. It's an extremely numerous bird all across the Northern United States and Canada. And it migrates through our area in pretty big numbers, but you wouldn't think it because in, it, it, it's only passing through at a time of the year when most birders are, are not looking for migrants anymore, like the beginning of June. And also in fall, it's coming through right now and it's, it's silent. The only thing you really hear from it is a pip note. And um, that pip note is um, a really reliable way to find it, but, uh, but if you're not familiar with that note, you're just not gonna find it and you're gonna think that this is a really rare bird. The other bird here is a Lincoln Sparrow and Lincoln Sparrow is a skulker. It makes a uh, really hard chip note. And if you know that really hard chip note, your detection of this bird will go way up, especially uh, in the spring and the fall times when people think this bird is kind of rare. But banding data, bird banding data, tell us that both of these birds are pretty common in the spring and at the fall, in the fall when they go through. So anyway, I provide these examples to, to just really impress on you that there are always birds out there that you can't detect. Sometimes it's entire species like these that are hard to find, but more commonly it's individuals in populations of birds that you're used to seeing, like robins. Half of them are doing something that you can't see or you can't hear, so you're not gonna count them. So if you can't get a total count of all the birds that are out there, what do you do? Well, there's one thing you can do and that's called an index survey. And, and almost every bird count known is an index survey. But there's an interesting thing about index surveys that make some bird counts better at measuring change than other ones. And we'll talk about that a little bit because there are a lot of bird counts out there and BBS is the gold standard for a specific reason. But we'll have to talk about this in a little more detail to understand why. So take a look at this picture right here, right? So here's this city. Now, if you were, um, if you had a lot of money, if you had a big staff, let's say you work for the census department, you can afford to send an envelope to every single one of these houses and ask folks to fill out exactly how many people live there. And you're gonna get a very good idea for the number of people in that city. You're not, still not gonna get everybody though, right? Because there's homeless people that you might miss. There are some people who are just not detectable and you'll miss them. So what could you do to count this? Let, let's say um, you didn't have, you only had four staff and you didn't have enough money to mail out things. So what you could do is you could take your four staff members and put them on different roads, just like this one. And you could say, okay, at eight o'clock at night or six o'clock, we're gonna stand there and each of us is gonna count for one hour. We're gonna count every human body we see in a car going into the city. And then we'll do this year after year and we'll compare the numbers that we find. So what you're gonna get is you're gonna get something called an index. It's, it's a number that's gonna be far less than the true number of people that are in that city. So in terms of birds, we call that true number, the total abundance. And only omniscients really know that as you can see <laughs> illustrated in this um, picture here, although you'll meet a lot of birders who will tell you that they, they know every bird that's out there because they've counted them, but I guarantee you, I promise you, um, that is not the case. Your count is always going to be much lower than the actual abundance out there, unless you make some grievous error or something like that. Um, so the, the, what I show you on the screen here is the relationship between these two things. So fewer numbers at the bottom, more numbers at the top. And so these two dots here are showing you the representative um, relationship of these two things. All right. 
You don't need to get the total count of birds though in order to track what's going on with the population. Same thing with the number of people in those cars. You don't need to count the number, the absolute number of people that are inside the city as long as you know that the number of people inside the cars is changing in proportion to the total number of people in the city. So that's what we're doing with bird counts here. And that's what makes an index to abundant. Index means to point at. So it's literally this white thing pointing at the yellow thing and following the same trend. So that's what trend is. It's just a change in those numbers over time. So in the bird world, we don't stand on the roadside and count the number of cars. Of course, what we do is we conduct these things called point counts. So here's a little caricature, a little picture of what a point count looks like. This fella here, he's standing there and he's writing down all the birds that he hears and sees at this point during a fixed period of time. And in this little bubble down here, what you see is C-A-C-H would be Carolina chickadee. So in his mind, he hears Carolina chickadee and he's tracking it as it's moving across. He hears a couple of American crows and an American goldfinch comes flying through, giving it a little particular call that it does. A red-tailed hawk comes through and some blue jays are mobbing it. He's writing all that stuff down. That's a point count. But the thing about this process of having an index to abundance is that um, you must use great care with it because as we were kind of imagining there in the city, if you're standing on the roadside and you're looking at the number of cars that are going by, well, if you decide instead of being there at six o'clock at night, you're going to go out at uh, three o'clock because it's less work. There's fewer cars coming by. Well, that's going to change the number of individuals that you count. And if that's not captured, um, that you changed your time, people are going to think what really changed is the count of where the absolute number of people changed in time. So in that case, you ruined your index to abundance. It's no longer an index to abundance. It's now just telling you about how you differentially collected that information. So if you don't want that to happen, if you really want a good index to abundance, you want to make sure that this incomplete count that you're counting, that everybody's counting, really does uh, track the real population, then you have to control for these two sources of error. The first one is normal error. Now, normal error, you know, don't, the fancy words here are not what's important. The concept is what's important. Normal error is when, when you have a quarter in your hand and you flip that thing four times and you find out that it landed on heads three times and tails one time. And then you say to yourself, well, this is not a 50-50 shot. Well, it is because normal error means that you have to flip that coin a lot of times in order to see the 50-50 relationship bear out. If you don't flip it enough times, you're going to get an impression of something that's um, incorrect. It's simply that you just didn't have enough of a sample. But that's easily fixed. You just um, sample as much as you possibly can. And Chan knew this. So Chan came up with an arrangement, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, in the BBS where we have lots of point counts strung together so we can get over this normal error problem. The second one though is more difficult to get um, past. And this is the one that really vexes most bird count, um, bird counting programs. So most point bird counting programs have a large sample size. That takes care of the normal error. What they don't take care of though is the bias error. So let's talk a little bit about this bias error. So there's several things that can keep your counts from tracking the real population. And they are if you choose sampling sites in a biased way. So for instance, if you're going to um, uh, parks, if you're going to beautiful forests to do your counts, if you're going to um, places that you feel more safe, but you're possibly missing other areas where um, bird populations may be doing something quite different. Um, it's also if your sampling sites are changing between years, then the comparisons of numbers collected at those sites are going to differ 
largely because they're different places. Another one is effort. Everybody has to put in the same amount of effort. If you count for an hour and somebody else counts for a minute, obviously a big difference there. And every counter has to meet the same minimum skill level. So if some people are able to rep recognize those um, alder flycatchers by peep sounds and uh, Lincoln sparrows by chip notes, they are going to detect more of those birds and so their counts are going to be different. And then you also have to um, avoid any conditions that interfere with counting. So for instance, if you're doing a bird count and you're keeping a tally, but half of that time you spend looking down mushrooming, as a lot of us are apt to do, then those bird count numbers are really not going to be comparable to a time when you're out there and you're really pushing it hard. So let's look at this real quick in a little more detail. Free choice is a big issue in bird counting programs. And we're caught really in a bind because as birders, we like free choice. We have our own um, goals and priorities. And for bird count programs, they have different goals and priorities. And every bird counting program is kind of like a business. It has to strike different trade-offs and balances and that defines what the project model is. So for instance, eBird has a project model where it's all about free choice. And that, that's fantastic because what it means is that you get a ton of data and folks who are out birding are getting to go to the places that they really want to go. The breeding bird survey is on the total opposite end of that where there is really no free choice at all because the emphasis is on standardizing where the counts come from. So again, birders like to go to productive, protected areas, easily accessed areas. I mean, people don't like going through marshes and swamps on their daily birding runs and geographical convenience, places that are near them. One of the other things is um, uh, the duration of your counts, which we talked about. Um, Sometimes folks feel like just recording the amount of effort in the field, like you were Christmas counting for um, eight hours versus two hours. Those are, those are good metrics to use to get some idea for how long you were in the field, but that's not necessarily um, a apples to apples comparison. Um, same goes for time of day. Um, time of day is a really big effect with birds, as we all know. Just like with counting cars at certain times of the day, traffic's busier sometimes than other times. And we all know that if you want to be a birder and you want to be any good at birding, unless you, you're really into owls, you have to get up early and you have to spend a lot of time out in the morning. And then we all start getting tired around 9 or 10, and, and that's partly because the birds are doing different things at that time that make them less detectable. And then on a broader scale, um, when you sample during the year is very important as well. So I'm just gonna mention a quick concept here because I just think it's so neat. Um, I have done a lot of work in the tropics and one of the things that really shocked me when I first went down there is that, you know, a lot of folks who are in the tropics, biologists down there, they, <laughs> they just bang their head at the fact that we in the temperate region um, have some very rigid ideas about the way that um, birds and, and life in general works. And when you travel beyond uh, the temperate region, you get a very new perspective for how lucky we have it up here. So because we have great seasonality up here, birds pretty much arrive at the same general time. Um, individuals of populations pretty much arrive at the same general times and then they leave at the same general time. So for instance, orchard orioles and Cerulean warblers and things like that are packing up and leaving. Some birds have already left. Um, water thrushes are tough to find right now. So there's very high synchrony in when they all, all leave. And there's very high synchrony in when they arrive too. So most American red starts will arrive on the breeding grounds within about a week of one another. And there's important reasons for that because they really do have to, they really do have to arrive at about the same time in order to be um, competitive for both resources and females as well. So anyway, we have this very high synchrony and that makes um, a really interesting opportunity for bird counts because it's a great time to find birds all at the same time 
all pretty much doing the same thing, all singing their heads off, and they're very detectable at that time. We have tried to expand the BBS into tropical regions, and it doesn't really work very well because there, birds are all doing, individuals of species are all doing different things throughout the year. Some birds may be, some individuals may be breeding in February, and other ones may not breed until May. So there's a lot of heterogeneity. So the synchrony is a really big thing for us, and the BBS really capitalizes on that because it's a time when we know detectability is really high and all the birds are pretty much doing the same thing at that time. Um, I mentioned observability. Hey, look, we're all learning. I mean, I'm still learning all the time. Mikey and I, uh, scarcely a day goes by when Mikey and I aren't talking about some interesting aspect of detection of birds. Um, there's an interesting scarlet tanager call, for instance, a, a chirwee call that they often give when they're migrating. And I had heard one the other day that had a different tone to it. Um, and Mikey and I were discussing that. So, you know, we're always learning things. Um, everybody's acquiring things. And many people in this conversation here tonight probably um, are, you know, quite accomplished at hearing birds by ear. And for those of you who are not, you just kind of keep at it. And tools like um, the, uh, the raffle that we're having today, um, for the little app, that's a great way of learning birds by ear, but pretty much you just stick at it and you get better as you go. But at, at some point you hit a threshold where you are able to identify birds by sight and sound very quickly in a short period of time. That's about the time when you are not going to have your counts dramatically affected by your ability to identify birds. The worst kind of thing is when, for instance, you don't know the difference between the sound of Swainson's thrush and hermit thrushes. And so you mark every thrush you see for several years as a Swainson's thrush. And then you learn what hermit thrush sounds like. And then you realize that for five years, mo much of the data that you had reported was actually probably two different species. Those are very challenging for bird programs to get around. And so that's why programs like BBS have very high thresholds in terms of um, uh, skill levels. Anyway, one of the things that we all have to deal with um, with detectability is beyond our control. Um, kinglets and uh, cedar waxwings are something folks in BBS have always used to try to get a gauge on how folks are doing, uh, especially men, because men have hearing loss at a certain time. Here you go right here. Um, you can see that as folks age, their hearing drops off um, in certain frequency ranges. And if you're young, you know, you don't have too much frequency loss, but as you get older, you're losing a lot of your um, high pitch frequency um, ability. So most of us know older birders who can no longer hear cedar wax wings and, um, and even grasshopper sparrows. And that's at about the point when BBS observers um, usually naturally move out. They, they know that and they let us know um, they're not able to participate because their estimates are gonna be biased. Um, from there on out. But other bird counts don't necessarily do that. And so, um, you know, people's data can be quite different when they're younger than when they're older, even though they're more skilled when they're older. Other things that are really challenging is uh, weather conditions, fog, smoke, rain, all play and uh, have an influence on bird detection. And so does strong wind. And you guys probably all know this, I'm sure from your own experience, but in my, in my experience, nothing affects um, bird detection more than wind does in terms of weather conditions. Um, wind creates very visually noisy environments for birds. And when you're a small bird and your eyes are on the side of your head, they're on the side of your head for a reason, you're looking out for predators all the time. And when things are very visually noisy, you, you um, tend to stick to cover and play it safe. So you're less detectable. So Chan knew all of this stuff and he decided he was gonna create this survey. And um, it's, you know, my only regret with what Chan did is that he called it the breeding bird survey, which unfortunately confuses everybody because there's breeding bird atlases and you can, you can do breeding bird surveys that are not the breeding bird survey. So um, most people call them BBS surveys or, or um, North American breeding bird surveys. 
But when Chan created this, he decided it was going to be called the Breeding Bird Survey, and he had a very clear goal right from the beginning, and it was to monitor trends of birds. So he didn't really want to measure absolute abundance, as we talked about. So to him, it was not a problem that um, we didn't know exactly how many grasshopper sparrows were in the spot where people were counting, just so long as they counted the same way year after year so they could see if there was any kinds of um, uh, changes in the population. The other thing I wanna to say too is he really was looking at continental and regional scales. And that's a big thing because you know nowadays we're so used to very spatially refined information, very granular information that sometimes we expect a lot from surveys, especially continental surveys, um, like BBS or Christmas bird count, and they're really not meant to perform on that level. The other, one of the other things that Chan did that ensured the success of the BBS is he had a really standardized approach to things. It was very scientifically rigorous based on a legitimate sampling design. And, and that sampling design was to take a bunch of these point counts and string them together into what he would call a route or what we still call a route. And these routes, um, it's a sampling unit basically of point counts that are along eligible roadways that are either secondary or tertiary roads. Um, and these, these point counts are situated um, when they're first set up, the point counts are a half mile apart so that they don't overlap in quarter mile um, sampling. So in other words, when you're standing at a point and you're conducting a BBS point count, you're counting everything you see and everything you hear, everything you see within a quarter mile though, and everything you hear. So if you put your stops every half mile apart, there's no overlapping of that quarter mile radius in which you're counting. So generally speaking, these routes are about 25 and a half miles or 24 and a half miles long, but usually they're longer than that. Stops are rarely half mile apart. They're usually longer than that, uh, further than that. And also there's Roadsides are a very dynamic place, so these stops tend to move around quite a bit between individuals over time. And that's fine. We capture that in our analysis as a control, which we can talk about more later. But at any rate, the idea of these routes is that um, they're randomly located. Somebody uh, throws down a random coordinate. We snap it to the nearest intersection, so you always know where it begins. And then we flip a coin, whether you go north or south, and um, these routes are located in degree blocks. So these are blocks of one degree latitude and one degree longitude. And the idea there is that you don't wanna clump these things together on the landscape. You wanna to try to spread them out somewhat evenly across the landscape. <clears throat> and then we have these other things too called strata, which you guys know, if you look in Maryland, you know that we have these physiographic strata. Well, this guy named Danny Bystrack, who many of you probably know as well, He's just an amazing guy. He, among many other things, came up with these things called bystrack strata, which were to take these kinds of physiographic strata, um, but convert them into bird strata so make them more, more realistic to where birds actually occurred and not necessarily vegetation or, or geography. And uh, anyway, he did this for the entire United States and our, each route is nested within a particular physiographic strata. So what this allows you to do is you can use political boundaries to, to aggregate data, or you can use these phys um, physiographic strata. So you could say, show me everything that's in physiographic or all the results from physiographic strata 11. So that's the science part of it. Well, he also had a really simple and very straightforward field protocol. The field protocol is that these routes are sampled once annually um, they're at the height of the breeding season. It's usually in Maryland. It's the very end of May um, on some of our routes that are in the south and the east, um, but generally most routes are run in June here. They can be run into July up into Canada and the nor northern United States as well, but only the beginning of July. Because again, we're trying to hit that synchrony, that period of synchrony. Um, these routes all begin at a pre-established start time. It's one half hour before local sunrise, as many of you probably know. A half an hour before like local sunrise doesn't mean it's dark out there. Although it is dark um, for a short while, you get maybe about 10 minutes of dark before several, civil twilight really starts to kick in. And so that's your opportunity to get some night birds, um, including night jars and also some owls. 
And these routes are only conducted under favorable weather conditions. So no rain or wind or a oh, very low wind um, and no fog. Only one observer um, conducts these routes and that's the assigned observer. And that's very important because we use observers as a covariate so that, um, for instance, if uh, Mikey is counting uh, on a route for 10 years, he may find that there's no change in robin population in the robin population at all. But then I come along and replace him as the observer on that route. But I count slightly differently than Mikey does, which can happen for a number of reasons. And now, every time he counted one, I count one and a half. So you can imagine there's a real jump in population, or at least an appearance of jump in populations between Mikey's data and mine. And really, that's just simply due to observer change. So we use observer as a covariate in our analyses. So in order to do that, we have only one observer um, conducting a route, and, um, and that's the assigned observer. They count everything they hear or see at, uh, for three minutes at each point count. Three minutes is not very long, and you really have to be on your game. I mean, you cannot be out there and thinking to yourself, is that a Carolina wren or a tufted titmouse giving a strange song? Um, you hear it all when you're out there, and you have to process the information very quickly. A lot of writing very quickly. Um, and also, um, I mentioned about soaring bird or rather visual IDs as well. That's everything within a quarter mile so that when you see some distant um, soaring vultures, you know, you try to estimate a quarter mile and you don't count them if they're beyond that. So lastly, the, the last thing that ensured that Chan built that ensured that the BBS was successful is it he recruited um, very skilled observers. And in fact, it's laughable because Jan is a, was an extremely nice guy, um, uh, loved by everyone. Um, but, but when he did ruffle feathers, it's when he created the BBS and he insisted that all observers who could possibly run BBS had to run a, a, a BBS route with him or on a sample route. And then he would vet the data. And he had to let a good many people in Maryland whom he knew well know that they unfortunately were not up to the task yet. So what is it about our BBS observers that make them unique amongst most birders? Well, most of them have been birding for more than a decade. And usually they're folks who are pretty determined to, um, to learn and to very quickly acquire um, challenging skills such as birding by ear. All spend more than an hour a week birding and and the overwhelming majority spend more than five hours a week birding. That's a lot of time. I have two kids and I can tell you, I'm probably not doing that these days. That's, that's very challenging. Um, you might be surprised, but about half of the uh, folks who do it are professionals. And that's, you know, a chicken and egg kind of thing. Are they professionals because they love birds so much so they got a job with birds? Or are they professionals who then decided to volunteer for BBS? In our experience, almost all of them are really diehard birders and they, they've gotten jobs in the profession because they, they love it so much. So Chan recruited these great folks. We still re recruit them today. Um, and we have um, covered the continent, which I'll mention uh, in just a minute. But in the beginning, the survey began in Maryland. And it was in a pilot year in 1965 when Chan was really cheesing off a lot of people and telling them who, who could and couldn't um, participate. But he ironed out a lot of the bugs in the survey in 65. And by 66, it spread all throughout the Eastern United States. 67, it was in um, the Central Plains. And then 68, it was coast to coast. And it's expanded northward ever since. And uh, the last editions we have are up in Nunavut and some of these other areas in Northern Canada. Um, a lot of observers have um, participated in the BBS over the years. In the beginning, um, we had, oh, somewhere around um, three to 500 observers in the Eastern United States between 65 and 66. And then we had these sort of punctuated jumps. Um, 85 to 90 is when most people will probably recognize that um, birding really took off in North America. The American Birding Association was hitting its zenith, and there were just a lot more um, opportunities, better field guides, and better outreach. And so um, BBS benefited from that growth. And we've now maintained 
um, our participant pool around 3,000 with some increases here or there. But BBS's program model is not necessarily one that's um, geared towards getting as many observers as possible. We're really just trying to fill the minimum amount of information um, or routes that we need to provide the information to meet the mission that Chan had um, so precisely laid out, laid out early off. So here's the extent of the survey these days. We have about 4,500 routes across the US and Canada, all shown by little dots here, and even more in Mexico as we've started to expand down there. You can see at the very top, those two little lonesome uh, routes up in the high Arctic there, which um, I would love to survey one day before I retire. Mikey would too, I'm sure. So in that time um, that the BBS has grown from where it began to where it is now, it has really become the foundation of North American land bird conservation. And that's not an underestimate to say that, um, or an overestimate to say that. There's no hyperbole there. Um, the BBS is used internationally. It's used by the United States federal government, the Canadian federal government, and Canabio, which is Mexico's federal government, to, um, to set conservation agendas, to understand um, relative and uh, conservation need of different species, to help target um, uh, endangered species candidates. The BBS really plays a vital role in every part of the conservation cycle, from assessing populations to developing targets and developing actions, implementing actions, and even evaluating actions. It's critically important to the work that Fish and Wildlife Service does and other Department of Interior um, agencies that are charged with monitoring bird or maintaining bird populations. It's also a critical science resource. Um, science is a little bit different than policy and uh, government action. Science is the massive um, pool of universities and academicians that are out there who do research on um, myriad bird-related topics. And you can see here on the left-hand side, there's a graph. This is number of publications. So the taller bar there um, means more publications. And the tallest one is, is close to 400 um, per year. Uh, or rather 400 between 2010 and 2019 alone. And you can see that the use of BBS has, uh, data has only increased. So the value of those data that were collected in 1966 and in early decades is exponentially growing. And, and that's just the amazing thing about monitoring data. When it's good data, um, its value only grows as time goes on. You, it's irreplaceable. You can't go back and get it again. So. Um, Academics look at all kinds of different things from ecology to um, epidemiology, all sorts of different stuff with BBS data. And of course, the biggest scientific product that's come out in recent years that most people, probably everyone on this um, call are familiar with is the Three Billion Birds paper, or the massive decline of the North American avifauna that came out in the journal Science um, just a couple of years ago. Well, that was based almost exclusively on BBS data. 82% of um, what was used in that publication came from the BBS data set. So that just goes to show you how important BBS is. And I will mention too that um, if you look at all of the press that came out about it, the interesting thing is you rarely see any press that mentions that they used BBS data. And there are several reasons for that. One is because during that time, we were forbidden in USGS for, um, from speaking with the, um, the press about these, this paper here because um, we were under some very high scrutiny. There are legitimate reasons for that. And of course, there are some political reasons for that. But um, a sad part of it is, is that most of the visibility that BBS got by way of its data really didn't materialize into um, visibility for the program itself. And, and that comes down in the end to um, the funding that we could use to keep the survey going over time. So in Maryland, this is what the distribution of routes look like. Um, they're spread out um, mostly across the state, but there's been attrition. And if you look at Baltimore, you can see, I mean, Lock Raven Reservoir all the way down to um, Baltimore City, there's really no place you can put 50 stop route now that's on a secondary or tertiary road. Um, it's just too busy in there. And even Southern Harford County is that way as well. 
<clears throat> and Howard County, of course, anybody who lives in Howard County understands, um, and Montgomery. At any rate, um, those are the routes in Maryland and they give us a lot of information and we can look at some of that information. And now that I've told you about um, how the survey works and a little bit about its history, let's move on to, um, to some of the findings that we've learned from BBS over the years. BBS trend data tell us about a lot of different um, aspects of birds. And you can see in here, there's a gray line right through the middle of there. That's your trend line, right? So what I'm gonna be talking to you about here, I'm gonna show you some of these graphs. These graphs are all gonna be the same. There's um, the average count is on the left-hand side. So the absolute number that's there doesn't really matter because again, these are not, um, these are not total abundance of birds, they're relative abundance. Um, so the number doesn't really matter. What really matters is the relationship from between the years of data. And so that's what shows you the up and down in the bird's um, population trend. So here, I wanted to mention something too, because I'm gonna give you trend numbers and I'll say like, this bird has increased by, you know, 5% per year or something like that. Well, that comes from snapping a trend line on there. Well, that's kind of an unrealistic thing because here you can see Carolina Wren has had a lot of jigs and jogs up and down and the trend line is very simple and gives you just a straight number. So looking at the graphs is very helpful in understanding what happened. This is Carolina Wren, which many of you probably know is really a tropical Wren. It's only um, expanded into North America in relatively recent time. And I'm only talking about you know 10,000 years, which is a blink of an eye in terms of birds. And it's actually been quite a bit less for most of these birds. Carolina Wrens um, have been moving steadily northward even within the 20th century. Um, so that th this is a very recent arrival to North America and to especially our area. Their clutch size is very small because they're a tropical bird essentially, and their behavior is still very much like a tropical bird. And lo and behold, they respond to weather very much like a tropical bird does. So if you look here, one of the things that you'll see is um, some real jigs and jogs and those uh, real um, declining periods were after big snowfalls. Here you go, right there. Um, really harsh winters um, uh, are really challenging on Carolina wrens. Now, interestingly enough, this is attenuated out a little bit. You don't see this as much now because even when we have blizzards, so many folks are feeding birds now that um, Carolina wrens still manage to eat through during the winter time. And the other thing is too, is when we get big snowfalls now, they tend not to last very long. They may last um, four or five days. And then of course it's a 70 degree day and it melts. Um, this is another kind of product that we have. It's not a trend graph or the trend number, it's a trend map. So here's loggerhead shrike and loggerhead shrike as, as most of y'all know, um, has just fared extremely poorly over the past, um, uh, well, since 66 is when we know it's really declined, but even before then. And that's the changing nature of farmer, farming largely that has affected this bird. You can see this particular bird right here is, is uh, earning its namesake. It's about to impale this insect on a thorn. It's often called the butcher bird because of this habit of imp um, impaling prey on thorns and also on fences. Oh, I'll also add about um, loggerhead shrikes. Loggerhead shrikes used to be a breeding bird in Maryland and even all the way down towards Culpeper. There are still some down in Culpeper in Virginia, but largely the Eastern population is gone. Um, the last ones are up in Ontario and that population has really declined quite a bit as well. So when I first started birding back in the, you know, 80s, I guess earlier mid eighties, um, people used to go to Delaware to find loggerhead shrikes wintering um, because they were the birds from the Northeast in Canada that used to come down, but they're largely gone now. And there's a lot of restoration efforts to bring them back, but it's not working very well. Um, here's something else that's really interesting that shows up in graphs. Here's an American crow. By the way, something really cool about this, a lot of people feel like you can't tell the crows apart. How could you, right? They're both, they're both black and they're about the same size. Well, you definitely can. If you look at the upper back of this bird right here, you'll see it's very scaly. Um, if you ever have the chance to look at a fish crow or an American crow in hand, one of the things you'll notice is fish crows on the edges of their feathers, their feathers are a little bit loose. They're not really tight. 
American crows, on the other hand, the edge of their feather is very tight and it makes a kind of like um, rim at the edge of the feather. And you see that as scaliness on the backs of these birds. And so this bird is clearly an American crow. There are some other things too, proportionally, the, the thighs are a little bit longer, a little bit like the Forster's turn, common turn kind of thing. Cool thing about their data though, is if you look at this American crow graph in Maryland, notice how, boom, in the early 2000s, there was a massive drop. Probably you know what was going on there, West Nile virus. So West Nile virus first showing up, started showing up in 2001 and by 2004, it was rampant in the area and lo and behold, the crow population showed it to us. You see this if you look all across the range of American crows. And so this is something that's very cool. Here again, you can see this photo, by the way, um, very scaly back. But you can see this drop in crow populations moving westwards. So um, epidemiologists had put this together as they were trying to track the expansion of West Nile virus, and they didn't really have very good monitoring tools. They were trying to um, take blood samples from horses and, um, and farm animals to try to see if they could track the movement. But it turns out that BBS data ended up being one of the best indicators because as time went on, so on the, on the right-hand side here in Maryland, you see that dot right in the beginning of the 2000s there and, and when the population was really starting um, to drop. And then as you move westward, you notice it's not until the last 2000s, uh, the late 2000s in Oregon. And again, that's, um, that's because the West Nile was spreading westward. Um, I mentioned that BBS data tell us about all different parts or inform the conservation and planning cycle um, at all different parts. And one of the ones that I mentioned is it allows us to track whether the things we're doing are really helping or not. And this is a really great example. Here's Newt Swan. And many of you might remember that, um, you know, in the 90s, in the in the 80s and the 90s, really, there, Newt swans were non-existent. There were just a few on ponds here or there, but no one thought that they might spread. But then all of a sudden, something happened in 1990, and there was a population release, and boom, they started growing exponentially. And then control efforts um, kicked in, and by, um, by the early 2010s, they were largely gone from the state. And every now and then a few show up and DNR is pretty diligent about going out and making sure that they're controlling. You know, looking at trends is um, interesting business, but you always have to be careful about something because um, it's very easy to get into a mindset where you think things are changing, we have to set things back to the way they were. But the decline that we see here um, with chestnut-sided warbler is interesting because John James Audubon only saw one in his entire lifetime of working with birds, one in life, I should say. Um, and even that was a fleeting glimpse for him. So this was not a very common bird back in his time. And then what happened, of course, is um, through the uh, mid to late 1800s, all the way up into the 1900s, there was just massive felling of of forests. And as we did that, of course, um, habitat for a lot of birds declined. But after World War II, a lot of that started coming back. And when it did, it went into shrub scrub habitat. And um, chestnut sided warblers really started rebounding in the early 1900s, all the way up until about the 1950s or so. And as you can see here, the 1960s and 70s, their numbers were still holding pretty steady. And then they started declining as all of these successional habitats have now moved to um, older forests. So essentially, nature is doing what we want it to do. It's creating the Eastern uh, successional landscape um, or the, the ultimate climax, climax landscape in the East. And of course, chestnut sided warbler is going back to what it was before. There's some other things that are interesting too about trends that can be misleading. So here, oven bird is shown in blue and Kentucky warbler is shown in red. Um, again, I wish we were all in person so I could ask you, hey, does anybody have any questions about this graph? I'll tell you what the axes are, but I'll just tell you real quick here again, the, the numbers are on the left-hand side. Um, so basically, if you're high up on this graph, 
that means there's more of you. If you're low, there's fewer of you, and the numbers are going left to right. Okay, so the blue one here is oven bird. And when you look at this, you think, wow, oven birds are actually doing pretty well. They're increasing by about 0.17% per year. Now 0.17% um, is one of those things where it's kind of like, well, that seems so menial. I mean, how could that really be meaningful? But remember, it's why you invest in um, your retirement fund because compounded interest is a really, um, is a really great thing. It's also a very pernicious thing. Sometimes I look in the mirror and think I look like I did when I was 16, but it crept up on me gradually day after day. So that's what's happening with these numbers. 0.17% doesn't sound like much, but it actually um, over uh, 50 plus year time um, amounts to quite a population change. So at any rate, you look at the Kentucky warbler here. Now, most of you probably know that Kentucky warbler is highly um, dependent uh, on shrub understory for nesting success. And here its population has declined. Well, it's declined for two reasons. One, because there's a lot less habitat here than there used to be. I mean, obviously, um, Howard County, Montgomery County, uh, Prince George's County, Anne Arundel County, Baltimore County, Harford County, you know, you can see it, it's all gone. So those birds are gonna decline because of that. But they're also being hit because deer are depleting the understory and so they're getting double whammy there. So what is left over for them is not really great. Now, oven bird on the other hand is experiencing that same background level of decline because its population overall is dropping because it's losing habitat everywhere. However, the deer are working in its favor because essentially what the deer are doing is they're taking Kentucky warbler habitat and making oven bird habitat. They're eating the understory. And so now you've got an open understory with a really uh, healthy leaf layer. And that's what oven birds really love. I'm gonna show you just a few more things. I know I'm running over time, I'm really sorry folks. Um, but I'll show you a couple of things. Here's some, some trends upon trends upon trends. This is um, just basically what's happening with groups of birds. So um, this is complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Let me just show you real quick that on the left-hand side, there's a black line running straight up and down. That black line is zero. Everything to the left of that black line is not faring well. Everything to the right is faring well, which means of all the birds in those groups, the ones that are faring well are the ones that are experiencing positive trends. And that's pretty much just wetland birds. And that's because wetland conservation acts in the last 20 or 30 years have really worked. On the left-hand side is all of the other stuff that we're familiar with. The forest birds, the generalists, the, the um, grassland birds, the boreal forest birds that we see in migration here, they're all doing quite poorly. And each of those groups is comprised of a suite of species. So grassland birds would have like Dixacil in it, Bob, um, Bobolink will have um, grasshopper sparrow, the whole suite of grassland birds. Well, if you look at these pie charts right in the middle here, what that's showing you is of the suite of birds in there, how many of them are doing poorly. So when your pie chart is mostly full, that means that entire group of birds is, is doing poorly. These colors that are in these pie charts here and that are on that uh, graph on the left-hand side are reflected on the right-hand side in these numbers are in these um, squiggly lines you see. So again, this, these squiggly lines are just like the ones we were looking at before. Don't mind the stuff on, on the left-hand side, the negative 600, negative 400, negative 200. Basically, the higher up you are, the more birds, the lower down, the, the fewer birds there are. And you're moving from left to right, just in, on a timeline here. So what you see is the wetland birds are doing okay, right? Their number's kind of going up a little bit, um, but all the other birds are doing very poorly and grassland birds especially are doing poorly. So I don't wanna leave you with a bad news story here. I wanna make sure that you, um, you understand that um, there's a, a lot of challenges out there. I mean, what are we going to do? What are we going to bulldoze all the people off the planet here and, and plant forests back? These numbers are gone because the habitat's gone, and that's just how it is. And we have to kind of get to um, a realization that we, we, we have to be more careful about losing land 
um, cover and to probably um, maximize the productivity on the land cover that we do have. And that's gonna mean trade-offs again, because birds like um, chestnut-sided warbler is gonna lose out when you try to make the forest good for something like cerulean warbler. Um, so here's bald eagle right now. Um, here's the graph uh, uh, showing that these birds are doing remarkably well. <laughs> you drive down the road and you get out of your car and somebody says, I've never seen a black, or excuse me, a bald eagle, you wanna smack them. Because <laughs> you're like, just look up, they're there. They're almost always on the wing in the morning and especially in the evening and you'll see them in, during your daily commutes. This is what a 7.3% increase per year looks like. That sounds like a paltry number, but you compound it, you get a lot of bald eagles. They're doing very well. They're coming back after DDT, of course. Um, common raven, wow, what a story, right? I mean, when, when most of us started birding, um, common ravens were really sparse in, in uh, the Eastern United States and they were almost all in the mountains, but something happened. Something happened to them to pileated woodpeckers and to a number of other uh, birds that released them. So it could be that it just took time for that one individual or that one group of individuals to have enough plasticity in their behavior where they felt comfortable using new nesting substrates. The birds in the east here now that are in um, most of the eastern counties that are on the western shore of the Chesapeake Bay, they are using um, dams sometimes. They're using uh, cell towers, they're using lots of things like that that they never traditionally would have um, used. So now we are getting to be a little bit more like Europe where, where ravens are all over the place. And interestingly, ravens have been doing this on the West Coast for a long time. Ravens were all the way down um, in uh, human inhabited areas. So it's just a new behavior that started in the East here. That picture shows you the size of a raven versus a crow. Some people are curious about whether they're seeing a crow or a raven, but you can see this large spatulate or boat shaped tail and really long finger feathers. So it's, it's difficult to mistake them once you get a good picture for them. Osprey are the same way, right? Osprey were suffering from DDT and, um, and now they're recovering. And uh, it's a shame I don't have Cooper's Hawk in here, but Cooper's Hawk is a great example too. Cooper's Hawk was actually pretty rare in the, in the state when I started birding but uh, it's become quite common. I even have one nesting outside of my house right now. Um, it's really great to see that bird expanding, but not so great for your feeders or for the little songbirds. Um, Canada goose, wow, what a story, right? Um, that's a fascinating one. And I could tell you a lot about uh, Canada geese because a part of their spread started here at Patuxet by some folks who, who meant well, and they were crossing different subspecies of Canada geese to create this mutt that basically doesn't migrate. And as you know, it does not migrate and it hangs out. And this is a big problem now because um, it's in small ponds, which uh, all summer long experience eutrophication and um, algal blooms. But even worse than that is flesh eating bacteria and all kinds of other nasty stuff is on the rise in, in some of these. So you wonder why some of these um, sediment retention ponds are fenced off with high fences. They're not just to keep kids from wandering in there. They're oftentimes because pathogens have been detected in their bacterial loads that are way too high to um, be safe for anyone to go near. Um, if you have a sharp eye here, you notice something different here. There's um, in that photo, there's two cackling geese in there as well, which um, have become quite common in Maryland, not breeding birds that we'll never see that here. I'd be surprised if we do, but, uh, but they're here during the winter time. Wild turkey, another one, huge increases um, in Maryland, still kind of patchy, weird. I live in Patapsco State Park and I've seen one or two in the time that I've lived there and they don't seem to do very well. I'm not sure if that's because of um, populations of feral cats or foxes or something like that. Um, places probably where coyotes are not really common right now is where turkeys are still probably kind of low because coyotes dramatically reduced the uh, fox population, which preys on um, turkeys. And then I know I'm getting late folks here, but I'll just say a couple more things um, just because they're kind of cool. House finch, right? Wow, house finches. I mean, there were never house finches here. They were introduced in the east. They expanded. They ex increased by about 12, uh, well, much greater increase than that. I mean, what you're seeing there is if you're a mathematician, you know about exponential growth. 
that's exponential growth you're seeing there. And then all of a sudden, bam, mycoplasm, right? This uh, avian conjunctivitis really knocked down that population. And you can see the house wren population, or excuse me, the house uh, finch population has not recovered and is getting back to a more stable equilibrium there. But it was cool to track the population as it moved. Um, the west population moved eastward and the eastern population moved westward. Here you go. The very dark dots are 1970. 1985, they were moving into these lighter dots. By 2000 and, um, and or rather by 1990, they were in the Great Plains. And by 2005, they had closed the gap. This never would have happened um, back in the uh, early 1900s because the Great Plains were too open. But of course, we've, um, we've filled the Great Plains with trees now in part. So house finches love it. Uh, Rusty Blackbird, real big loser, 90% overall decline since 1966, and it's even higher than that now. It's like 95% decline. I mean, this used to be such a common bird when I was a kid. Um, there would just be flocks of hundreds of them in the wetlands. They, during the wintertime, they're very different than other blackbirds. They flip leaves in wetlands. And so if you want to find them, the best thing to do is find the biggest ephemeral wetland that you can or even if it's a wetland that's just heavily forested and has a lot of leaves on the end, go there in May, um, early May, late April, and um, listen for the sound of them singing. And a lot of time they're just walking along the, the um, shoreline there. Buick's Wren, another really interesting one. That bird used to be in Maryland, not no more, it's gone. Um, as the Appalachian folks say, it, 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 it is gone, not no more. Um, our shrublin birds are heading that way too, sadly. Field sparrows and eastern towhees that used to be so common are, are um, rapidly declining. Um, so, you know, these are things we can do by improving the quality of habitat um, that we have right now. And you know what, I, I'm gonna call it there. I, I could keep going on for a while, but I'll call it there. And um, if I put any of y'all to sleep, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Not at all, not for me anyway. Um, I don't see any questions that have come up in the chat so far. Um, Dave, do you have time to, to stick around and answer a couple questions for us? Absolutely, I love, I love nothing less. Um, so folks, feel free to either um, put your questions in the chat box or to turn on your mics and ask a question of our guest. <clears throat> ah, someone, O'Malley asks um, why the, if you could speak to why the BBS folks weren't allowed to talk about the survey, I'm sure she's referring to uh, the three billion birds um, <laughs> period <laughs> report, shall we say. Yeah. Well, you know, there was a, <clears throat> uh, you know, when you work for the government, you really um, are subject to the political environment that you're living in at the time. And the last administration was, um, was very careful about the science. And that's not a bad thing. You can't, you can't fault people for that. Um, you really do have to be careful nowadays. You know, there's, um, there's a lot of hay made out of things. And, and I think the head of um, Department of Interior and USGS at that time wanted to make sure that um, American people really got what they paid for and didn't get a hype machine. You know, USGS has always prided itself in providing um, good, rigorous science. And, you know, I think part of the issue was that um, uh, the new administration was really trying to get a handle on um, what the messaging was and try to control a little bit um, some of the hysteria that was kind of happening as so much information was coming out. And I think part of what happened there too was um, they didn't really have the lead time that I think they would have liked to have prepared themselves a little bit more for what inevitably happened that a lot of people were very interested in that. And um, I, I don't think they would have negatively controlled the message. I think they just were um, 
at a at a unique time for a unique administration. And so I think um, what they were really trying to do is to try to calm down the rapid spread of the story right after it came out to ascertain how reliable it really was. Um, we've got lots of questions popping up now. Um, Barbara Hill is asking about um, the forest fires in the West and and how extensive they are and um, how strong they are. And, and, and I guess she's wanting to know about how that affects bird populations. I, I'm sure there are upsides and downsides to that. Yeah, that's a great question. I was uh, just out in Utah and Nevada and um, Oh, a couple weeks ago, and I mean, it is incredible what these fires are doing. They are extremely hot, and they're burning everything right down to the ground. And you know, Western environments are pretty resilient. Um, there are definitely some habitats that can handle those kinds of fires. Most of them cannot, but there are some species within them that are at least rebounding. So essentially, it's setting the West back to a stage of succession that's maybe a little bit of equivalent to what we saw in the East here in you know, the early 1900s. So um, habitat communities out there are gonna change quite a bit. Some of these uh, fire dominated communities are really scorched back now um, and it'll take them a long time to get to the point of succession. They'll probably be grasslands for quite a while before um, some of these chaparral habitats come back or in the Intermountain West, some of these um, uh, pinyon juniper habitats and so forth come back. So they're, they're really devastating fires and BBS picks it up because the surveys still continue there after the fires are done. And um, there are researchers who were, are working on BBS data um, to try to understand what the influence of these, you know, really dramatic fires are on bird population. It's pretty interesting. It's not good <laughs> in the short term, but you know, who knows? Right, right. Um... Lynn, I think, is asking um, if you've had time to go through this year's data yet and whether there has been anything interesting to come specifically just from observations this year. Mikey, do you want to chime in here? Oh, Mikey not, might not yeah. be. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry, yeah. trying to find the, to find the button. button. Um, yeah, I, I haven't noticed anything, um, you know, that jumps out at me quite uh, yet. We're, we're still in the uh, data entry phase right now, so we're still waiting on a bunch of results. We're coming to the end of it, and we're really going to start uh, pouring through the data here in the next couple of weeks. Um, I, I guess the one big thing is um, just the excitement of people being able to run their routes again this year. I, I would say that's, that's a huge thing. There's a lot of uh, people that were really excited to run that, and... Um, it is have to be back out in the field being able to run routes. So, yeah, th that's a great point, Mikey. I mean, you know, when you do BBS routes, it gets in your skin. It really does. You get used to going back year after year. And it's um, David Holmes, who many of you might know, is in Maryland here. He has done more BBS routes over a longer period of time than anyone. Um, I wish I had his number off the top of my head. Maybe Mikey does and could throw that out here, but. Um, when I spoke with Dave after he um, retired from BBS, he was hit just like all of us. Um, you know, your hearing fades and it's, it's best to step away at that point. And the thing that he was, that saddened him the most was just, it, just, yeah, he would sometimes just go out to his routes just to see it. He had done it for so many years and it just becomes part of you like children. Yeah, and he has run 509 routes over 51 years, so impressive, very impressive. <laughs> so it, it takes about, you're talking about maybe 10, 10 and a half hours of volunteer time for each route. You're in the field for about six hours. You're, you know, um, taking care of your data and managing data entry for the rest of that time. So you think about that and you multiply that times the number Mikey had mentioned. The government gets a really great deal off of people, but that's why the BBS program is as inexpensive as it is. It's an extremely inexpensive program relative to um, other programs. We, um, 
we sample more than 400 species and it's about a thousand dollars per species, which is almost nothing. That's great. Um, Lynn also asks if there are any specific species that you are concerned about due to climate change. I guess that's really several questions because do you know that the changes are related to climate change just based on your surveys? And if yeah. so, which ones? Yeah, boy, that's a great point. And thank you for leaving me that out there because really what, <laughs> what, um, what trends do is they show you that something's happening, but they don't tell you what the causative factor is. Sometimes the trend is declining because the birds are not reproducing as well as they used to. Sometimes they're declining because um, the survivability is um, decreasing. It could be myriad factors, but one thing I will tell you is that um, this often surprises people, but birds have an extremely energetically demanding life. So every moment of a bird's life, every moment, and I'm not exaggerating there, is really an, an energy balance. Those birds arrive, they are stressed from a long flight, they get here, they must immediately set up territories. They put tons of energy into singing to attract females. And I'm only talking about the male perspective here. The female pers perspective is um, equally draining, if not more, but the male sings and then he um, secures a female. He has to make guard, they lay eggs. You would think he has a little break there, but he doesn't because during that time, he also has to defend that territory from other birds the nestlings hatch and now the adults are feeding like crazy. Now, during that time, that's a very value, very vulnerable time for those birds, not only because they're flying around and, and birds can, other predatory birds like Cooper's hawks can spot them, but also because most birds are right on the line of being over their body temperature. In fact, they actually, so if you know anything about seals, when seals dive underwater, they're using so much energy in their muscles that they're using up all of their air and they go into an oxygen debt. So when they come out of the water, that's why they lay on the rocks because it takes them a while to pay off the oxygen debt to get rid of the lactic acid in their body. Birds do the same thing, but with temperature. So birds are going into a temperature debt during the time that they're feeding nestlings. They are moving so much foraging, flying, all of that, that they are in the red, like your car, and then they have to come back and they have to take some time in the evening to try to dissipate some of that heat. That's what makes birds extremely sensitive to climate change. So climate change is opening up a lot of pathways for birds. So birds that come from the tropics like Carolina wren, they can handle that heat. They have a lot of metabolic processes that are very good at handling the heat. Coastal birds handle the heat fairly well. They have these massive bills. If you look at the subspecies of almost every bird that's in uh, coastal marshes, they have massive bills. And those massive bills are really giant air conditioners. So they can handle a lot of, of the heat that's out there. But you know, when you're thinking about forest birds, especially um, birds that we tend to associate with say the mountains of Maryland, those birds are extremely sensitive to temperature. And even birds like um, ceruleum warblers are extremely temp uh, sensitive to temperatures. Um, most folks think of ceruleum warblers as being these lowland coastal plain birds um, or that are in these, these uh, coastal, excuse me, these riparian forests. But really, if you look at where um, ceruleum warblers nest, they tend to nest on the east side of ridges. And a lot of that is likely due to um, physiological uh, tolerances and temperature tolerances. So anyway, all that to say that um, climate change is having a big effect on a lot of these birds. There's no doubt about it. We don't fully understand how a lot of it is, but probably a lot of it is, is just pushing these birds past their physiological tolerances and they just can't handle it anymore. So their populations move up slope. But there's only so far up you can go if you live in the lower Appalachians. And so for those birds, we'll be losing them. So I'd encourage folks who are really interested in that to go over to the Audubon website. Audubon has a fantastic project that they uh, undertook to model 
what the current distribution of birds are now under our current temperature regime, what it will be like under one degree Celsius increase all the way up to 3.5 degrees Celsius. Look at say bobolink, you will be utterly shocked that bird has to move north to um, tolerate the heat regime that's coming and it's gonna be pushed right up against the Taiga forest. They'll have no place to go and it is gonna decline severely. Wow, yeah, so. <laughs> it's very sobering, it's very sobering. Um, I'll ask you a much simpler question from Barbara. She said on the slide where you showed all the various routes um, in Maryland, she had a question about whether there was coverage in PG County. She, did, she couldn't quite tell that if it was covered. Yeah, I miss PG County routes and some in Anne Arundel. Mike, do you wanna talk about that? You had a love for those routes. Yeah, yeah, but we there's there are still there's still one route that's mostly in PG County. It's the Nottingham route, um, and it's a replacement route for the Cheltenham route, um, and it's down in southern PG County. Um, the Beltsville route was going for quite a few years, but the traffic just got to be too much, even on Sundays. Um, a lot of these routes will run um, on Sundays to reduce car counts and make them safer to run, but um, with most all the routes that existed in PG County before, they just got to be too dangerous for people to be standing on the side of the road, not enough safe places to pull out so um, and get their car off the road. So really the only thing left is, is that route down in Southern PG County now, so. Yeah. Okay, I, we're, we're closing in on 8.30 and um, I would like to um, let our speakers go and, and then stop our recording so that I can do the raffle with folks who are interested. Um, but thank you so much, Dave and Mikey, both of you for your fascinating talk and your interesting information. I can't wait. Is there a website where, where you guys publish any of mm. your findings that you could share with people before you go? Yeah, thank you for asking. That's uh, like one of those uh, forgetting the forest for the trees kind of thing. So I'm so glad you asked that. Yeah, we have a website. You can just go in um, to your uh, any search engine and type in um, North American Breeding Bird Survey, and it will bring you to our website. And that's where observers log in to enter their data. And there's also some information there. There's an article called uh, it's listed right on the center of the page is overview article, which provides almost all the information that Mikey and I have given you today. Um, and on the right hand side of that page, you can download the raw data from our BBS um, website in real time. It'll also link you to a spot where you can pull down the entire data set from 1966 up until now. And then there's also a section there that has analyzed results where you can get graphs like this and lots of other information as well. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. And for the other folks, please stick around because um, Dave gave us this fantastic idea of, of giving away the app LarkWire. So um, that's our plan. So if you're interested, please stay. And thanks again, guys. It was a delight to have you. I just want to say real quick before we leave too, please feel free to write Mikey or me um, you can find us on the website and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Awesome. Thank you very much for having us tonight. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks guys. Take care everyone.